Hi, I'm Charlotte Moore, Irish Rep's Artistic Director. And I'm Kieran O'Reilly, Irish Rep's Producing Director. And I'm Amy Holmes, Executive Director of the Adrian Brinkerhoff Poetry Foundation. Thank you for joining us for Poetic Reflections, Words Upon the Window Pane. For the past several years, the Brinkerhoff Foundation has worked with Irish filmmaker Matthew Thompson to create beautiful short films that blend dazzling Irish poets of the 20th century with potent new voices of the 21st, capturing them in stirring, personally significant locations in Ireland, London, and New York. When Amy approached us about presenting the Foundation's first major U.S. exhibition of these phenomenal films, we jumped at the opportunity. In addition to being available online, both at irishrep.org and brinkerhoffpoetry.org, visitors and passersby can stop and view the films in a new installation in Irish Rep's lobby windows. This is the first public activation of our space since the COVID-19 shutdown began in March of 2020. We are delighted to use our window panes to reflect the multicultural face of Ireland. If you're in New York, stop by and see it on West 22nd Street. During this long pause in our communal cultural life, the pleasures and comfort of poetry have taken on greater importance and new resonance. We hope visitors to the exhibition, both online and in person, will respond to the universal themes explored by some of Ireland's greatest poets of the 20th century and some of the most important and diverse voices writing in English today. To watch, stop by on 22nd Street or watch online from now through May 2nd. And thank you for joining us. I want to be like Frank O'Hara, but I've never stood in a club doorway listening to Billie Holiday. Most of my time in this city, I've been a mother, and I know I've spent too much time in Sainsbury's Dalston branch, even if it has its own inimitable vibe and a huge range of root vegetables. My own roots sink deep into the garden, and I can't bear to leave in case I miss a single bloom or one of those odd powder blue butterflies passing through on its way to Hackney Marshes. I swing in the hammock to the sound of a police siren, but I've never stood in a club doorway, my poems in my pocket like Frank. My books are stuffed with shopping lists, and I'm sure that's not Frank. Although once at 11 a.m., looking for the new GP surgery in Green Lanes, I stuck my head in the doorway of a Turkish men's club and they scattered from their chest like leaves. I felt a bit dangerous then, like Elvis in 56. I think Frank would have liked it, the way one brave man approached me slowly, his hands out in front, as if he was about to catch something. I do not know what it means to be black. My version of black culture is cultivated by MTV and news reports. It's big booty bitches, blunts and Bugattis. It's black men dying in streets, oppression piercing their skulls, a white lobotomy teaching the ways of correct behavior. He's grown up without a dad being part of the 51.2% of black kids in the 90s who were fatherless. A white mom tearing a comb through my hair because nobody taught her how to braid. It's 10 years of flat irons and chemicals because nobody was there to tell a little girl, your hair is as old as humanity itself. Each strand tells the stories of your ancestors. Each car represents black history and the ongoing fight to keep growing, no matter how small the progress may seem. It's jollof rice and spice fish at your best friend's house because mama don't know how to cook it and it's asking why other kids call you monkey and why you don't look like them. It's screaming at a mother who did nothing but lay her life down for you. Why don't I look like the other kids at school, mom? Why do I look like this, Mom? 
Why does the sun turn my skin to brown, mum? Who am I? Just ask him why your dad is like air. You know he's real. He's the reason life runs in your veins, but you've never seen him. It's a birthday card on a dreary day, pleading your return. Hushed tones and whispered confessions behind glass doors, revealing more secrets than Shaka Brown bodies jumping overboard. I'm told my culture is watermelon, Kool-Aid, and chicken fried in Crisco. History books say it's barbaric traditions and voodoo-infused medicine. America tells me it's uneducated men and women. Empty thoughts and even emptier lives. Their pockets full of money almost as dirty as the color of their skin. Crack pipes handed down like family heirlooms. I'm destined for failure. I'm not white enough for the white kids, not black enough for the black kids. The spice stings my tongue like the N-word thrown around in front of me by white kids. Unknown to the fact that Africa is in me. It's in them. And together, we are Africa. My hair is straightened by the Western world. And my skin faded by racism. I lose my identity inside of myself. An endless journey of who I am and why. My reflection in the mirror speaks to me about my homeland. The girl staring back is more than just another light-skinned mixed girl who grew up in a white girl world. I am more than an identity lost in self-ignorance. I may not know what it means to be black but I sure as hell know what it means to be me. They say you ain't supposed to be here, black girl. You ain't supposed to wear red lipstick. You ain't supposed to wear high heels. You ain't supposed to smile in public. You ain't supposed to smile nowhere, black girl. You ain't supposed to be no more than a girlfriend. You ain't supposed to get married. You ain't supposed to want no dream that big. You ain't supposed to dream at all. You ain't supposed to do nothing but carry babies and carry felons and carry weeds and carry silence and carry families and carry confusion and carry a nation, but never an opinion. Cause you ain't supposed to have nothing to say, black girl, not unless it's a joke. Cause you ain't supposed to love yourself, black girl. You ain't supposed to find nothing worth saving in all that brown. You ain't supposed to know that Tina, Beyonce, Cecily, Shonda, Rhymes, Shine, 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 black girl. You ain't supposed to love your mind. You ain't supposed to love. You ain't supposed to be loved up on. You only supposed to pose voodoo child, vixen. So you're supposed to pop out babies and hide the stretch marks. You're supposed to be still. So still they think you statue. So still they think you chalked outline. So still they keep thinking you stone. Until you look more Medusa than Viola Davis. Until you sound more Shanae than Kerry Washington. Until you more side-eyed than Michelle Obama on a Tuesday. But you tell them you are more than a hot coming to Washington set. You are Kunta Kinte's kin. You are a black girl worth remembering. And you are a threat. Knowing yourself, you are a threat. Loving yourself, you are a threat. Loving your kin, you are a threat. Loving your children, you black girl magic. You black girl fly, you black girl bring it, you black girl wonder, you black girl shine, you black girl bloom, you black girl, black girl. And you turning into a beautiful black woman right before our eyes. talk about you without mentioning your name. So I say, we went to see a film last night. Meaning you and I, or she treats me very well, as in you love me. Or 
I'm going for an Indian tonight. Implying a candlelit dinner for two. It isn't always easy keeping your name sheltered from my mother's lips, but I try. And I try because it stops me from hearing the drop of her mouth. The way I try not to imagine her standing by the kitchen sink at midnight, hungry for food and love. But I know she'll go back to that sacred spot over and over, the way the owl never forgets it sees its prey best at night. I've, I've learnt to use my love's name sparingly. You know this, don't you? That your name will never leave my mother's lips. I, I want to apologize. You do know how much I want you, us, to survive. Bless the fever in that night, in the sixth month of my life. Bless the fever for it gave me sight. It swore my brain to fit God's gift. It brought the hand that would lift each eye from my infant skull. Bless the sweat, my baby ball. Bless the horse that hauled the surgeon through dusk dark, half drunk and swearing into mine. Bless the flame. It sterilized the metal of the spoon. Bless the path between lid and bone, slipped and slid by the instrument of my deliverance from sight. Bless the handling of the knife. Bless that night gave me night. Wrapped around my bloody face, whispered how I could be grace notes, arpeggios, a piano roll of sound, copying each note from everything around me. You see, I'm sure at first there was the hurt and the scalding pain. But then again, Bless an infant's too short memory. All I know is what lies beyond light. I've learned this is what's right for this one right here. Yes. Bless the fever. And listen close. Spare an ear to this piano and shut your eyes close. I wake up thinking that I got symptoms, that I have to call to the doctor. I try to find words in a dictionary to explain everything. Where I was last days, what I was doing, who I met, where I could get it. I feel endless anxiety, 
endless fear. I feel guilty for being sick. I'm not sick, it's just my inflamed imagination. It is outside and inside myself. The virus is so invisible that you can find it everywhere. It is large. It contains multitude. There is nothing to survive anymore, nothing to escape. I wake up embracing it like a small pillow while being embraced by it, like by a worm in a tomb. Am I awake? Part one. I molded her body to what she was called. Our first words now seem like nothing in comparison to those that followed. Those that laid like water on our bottom lips, waiting for our breath to push them further into the other's mouth. Begging to be swallowed, whether in a whisper or a shout, not caring how the tongue writhed or the teeth trembled, but worried if they ever will. There upon our first meeting, I decided I would carry her beneath my wings as if her own had been broken. For I knew the mountains and the valleys of the worlds and her timid hills and fields. Between the gasps of gossiping teenagers, gushing away with the sun on their foreheads, we grasped each other in notion, scurrying in motion to piece together the body before us, and tying it up at our waist. Chattering in the nibbling rain, our noses stung from trying to smell the sea, and the misty blue of early summer skies when Braytown lumbered from its sleep, we would hold those thoughts upon our shoulders, dividing the limbs in half until I held the hands and her the feet past the Dargo River for every day for almost seven years. Part two and the body became its own. The day before our parting, we sat on my double bed, surrounded by the unfeeling walls of my studio apartment, crowded by my family's belongings packed into mountains of suitcases, drinking tea and eating cheap little cookies, and wrapping all the thoughts that we had mounted to the tips of our tongues until they were burdened and mumbling. We cried together that night, until it was so late she had to race home before she got into trouble. Part three, the body as a hearth. I shook my mind of everything I knew of her. Nooks, crannies, deaths, wits. Everything that she had hid from me and prayed for fire my sister became a burning bush. <laughs> 